Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stefan and Azim, for inviting me to the conference. In case you're wondering, any similarities between the authors of the paper and the organizers of the conference is purely random. Okay. So I want to start by noting something that we all know, which is that often economic data exhibits certain forms of dependence and heterogeneity. You can think about time series models, you know, spatial models, panel data models, but more generally I'm going to be talking about clusters. And by clusters here, I just mean a group of observations that might be somewhat um, related to each other. So the fact that we deviate from the, you know, say like standard IID setting, um, typically doesn't affect the way that you construct point estimators of parameters that you might care about, but it does affect the way that you're supposed to carry on inference. And so the standard practice has been to proceed as follow. Um, you will first invoke some appropriate law of large numbers and central limit theorems, so that way you will have, say, an estimator that is asymptotically normal with some variance covariance matrix. And then you will try to estimate this variance covariance matrix using some form of a hack or cluster covariance estimator. And then you will put those pieces together to construct a t-test or wall test and compare it with the standard normal critical value. The important thing to note is that for this, um, approach to be valid, you need to use an asymptotic approximation that requires the number of clusters um, to be large. So in this paper, what we're going to do is to provide tools that allow us to do inference in this context and that are based uh, or borrowing ideas for, uh, from randomization tests. So the idea is the following. If you think about uh, what randomization tests do, Basically, this approach will assume that the data, the distribution of the data, exhibit, uh, exhibit certain um, symmetry under the null hypothesis. And what that means is that the distribution of the data is invariant um, over a group of transformations. Okay? And if that condition is satisfied, then you can exploit this property to construct, construct tests that um, control size exactly in finite samples. Now, often, uh, you might think or people might argue that this symmetry doesn't hold for the distribution of the data, and therefore, uh, maybe um, a test like this, even though appealing, given its size property, uh, is not used. So, what we do in this paper is to propose randomization tests that work under approximate symmetry. And so, instead of assuming that the distribution of the data satisfies something, what we're going to um, assume is that a function of the data satisfies this type of symmetry in the limit. And what that means is that we you know we'll have a function of the data that you know oftentimes will be some say estimators and that that function converges weakly to some limit function and in the limit you have the invariance property that I mentioned before. And so if this condition holds then we'll show that we can construct tests that control, control the null rejection probability asymptotically. And the settings that we have in mind in which our test is particularly useful is in cases in which the, in where, where the data can be grouped into clusters. And basically, you have a small number of clusters with many observations within a cluster. The approach will be flexible enough that will allow the observations within the cluster to be dependent, will allow some dependence um, also across clusters, and it will allow the clusters to be heterogeneous. Okay. And so the main point that I will be clear as I move along is that for our approach to be uh, useful, we need to have clusters in a way that they identify the parameters that you are interested in. OK, so the outline of the talk goes as follows. I'll first quickly review randomization tests uh, for those of you who are familiar with this. And that will allow me also to talk briefly about the symmetric location model, which will be the first connection to some methods that have been proposed for this type of problems. And then I will move and present exactly what we're proposing in this uh, paper and, and present the main theorem that we have. And once we have that, I'll show you how you can apply this sort of like general abstract idea that I'm going to uh, describe in two to two very simple settings, uh, time series regression, linear regression, and a difference in difference case. And then in the paper, we also apply uh, the method to cluster regression, and we have an empirical application, uh, but we're, um, we're not going to be able to talk about that today. So let's start by reviewing how randomization tests work. So 
Here, this is a finite sample construction, so there are no index by n. So we'll just have some random variable x that has some distribution p. And under the null hypothesis, it says that p belongs to some subset that we're going to call bold p0. And the alternative is the unrestricted alternative. So the idea is that we're going to reject the null hypothesis with never a test statistic that we're going to here call t um, is large. And so the randomization test is going to construct sort of like a critical value for that test under this condition. And this condition basically says the following. Suppose that there's a group G of transformations that maps the sample space to the sample space. This is X here is the sample space of X. And if the distribution of X is invariant to transformations from this group, meaning G applied to X has the same distribution as the original X for any element in this group of transformations, then you say that this assumption R or this invariance property holds. And so if you think about it, at least, you know, it's a, there's a way to think about it is like you observe X only once, so you observe your test statistic only once. But since this property holds, if you know G, basically you can sample from G and in a way you're getting new observations from X and new observations from your test statistic that will <coughs> allow you to compute a critical value. So in terms of notation now, we're going to let M be the number of elements in this group of transformations and K be 1 minus alpha times N around it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compute all the values of the test statistic when you apply these transformations to X. And we're going to order these values for smallest to largest. And so once you have this list, the element in that list that will be important is the kth element. Remember K is 1 minus alpha times M. And in a way, that will be the critical value of our test. So now if you let me define M plus as the number of elements in this list that are strictly greater than TK, and M naught as the number of elements in this list that are strictly, uh, exactly the same as TK, then the randomization test is defined as a test that rejects whenever your test statistic is greater than TK, rejects with probability A when the test statistic equals TK, and it doesn't reject when the test statistic is below TK. So uh, as I said before, if this assumption R holds, then this construction gives you a test that controls size in finite samples and is also similar, meaning that the rejection probability is alpha for all distributions in the null hypothesis. Now, I don't have time here to go over the proof of this argument. This is a known result. But what matters, and, and something that I'm going to refer later on, is that to show this result, basically, the proof exploits this property over here. And what this property says is that even though you do not know the distribution of x, and so you do not know the distribution of the test statistic t, if you condition on this sorted list, okay, you know that the distribution of the test statistic conditional these values is uniform. And so this is a distribution that you know and you can use for the construction. So a few things to comment. M sometimes is too big, meaning the number of elements in the group might be very big. It doesn't matter if you just resample from G okay, in a certain way, meaning you just have to keep the identity of one of the elements and then randomly resample from G. Then the construction, I mean the validity of theorem 1 holds. So you still have finite sample control. So uh, whenever you know, we have applications later on in which M is very big, that's what we're going to end up doing. So now let me go over a simple example. Suppose that you have here X is a collection of Q, Q um, random vectors, where each of these, X, J, are independent and defined on RD. So the dimension is D. And we're going to assume that is this axis have a symmetric distribution about mu. Okay? So Suppose now that you want to test whether the mean of these random vectors is zero uh, or not. Well, in this case, given the symmetry here, an appropriate group of transformations is a group of sign changes. So these are, this is a group of transformations that will take one of these vectors and multiply this by one or negative one. And so you know, here g of x will be g1 applied to x1, g2 applied to x2, gq applied to xq, where each of these g's are either plus 1 or negative 1. Since assumption r holds, then you know, this test controls, finite, you know, controls size in finite samples and has the property of the theorem that I just showed. Now, if d is 1, meaning these random variables are scalar, and the distribution of x is normal or can be written as a mixture of normals, then the standard t test that we all know for testing whether the mean of a random variable is zero or not um, is valid for certain values of alpha. 
In particular, is valid whenever alpha is less than 8% or is valid whenever alpha is less than or equal than 10% as long as Q is not greater than 14. Now, it could be quite conservative, as I'm going to show you in a minute. And this result follows from a paper by Bakiram and Sekely, and it was used in econometrics by Bragman and Mueller and Bester, Conley, and Hansen. So let me take the setup in Bester and Ibrahim and Mueller, so where they were studying the validity of the t-test here. And so suppose that you have Q normals, but half of them have variance 1, and half of them have variance A squared. So here A is a measure of heterogeneity. Whenever A is 1, so we have ID data. If A is different than 1, we have two groups of distributions. And we're going to compare the t-test, as in Ibrahim and Mueller, with the randomization test, with the test statistic uh, um, using the absolute value of the t-test. And what you get is something that looks like this for eight observations and 16 observations. The here on this axis, we have A, the value of heterogeneity. And here, the rejection probability. The red line is the randomization test. The blue line is the rejection rate of the t-test. What you can see is whenever A equals 1, both tests give you 5%. And whenever you start having heterogeneity, the t-test, you know, control size is less than or equal than alpha, but it could be conservative, OK? And the more heterogeneity you observe, the more conservative the t-test becomes. Now, the t-test gets better as you increase the sample size. But the minute that you pass 14, remember, then you're restricted to consider alphas that are 8% or below, OK? So as you can see here, the randomization test is similar. So it does, it's not affected by the level of heterogeneity that you have in the data. So a few comments. The randomization test is valid for all alphas. That means that you can compute p-values using this approach. You can't do that with the t-test because you have restrictions on alpha. Our approach is valid for uh, vector uh, random variables, so uh, while the t-test is restricted to deal with scalars. Then this randomization test construction works for any test statistic, OK, and it's not limited to the absolute value of the t-test. Um, and it's similar, which translates into better power, especially when you are considered alternatives in which the, uh, that exhibit heterogeneity. Okay? So aside from that, it is also valid for any other symmetric distribution that is not normal or mixture of normals. Okay? So what we're going to do now is, you know, based on sort of like this advantage that randomization tests have in, you know, finite sample problems where the conditions to apply randomization tests whole, we're going to try to extend the range of uh, applicable cases in which you can use this type of construction. So now let me go over the setup again, but now thinking about what we're going to do. And since we're going to do asymptotics in the number of observations later on within a cluster, I'm going to bring the index n in here. So now xn are observations that have a distribution pn, and we'll have an all hypothesis that says pn belongs to some subset pn naught versus the unrestricted alternative. Okay. What we're going to assume, as opposed to the assumption R that I said before, is this assumption RW. And this is pretty much the only assumption that we're making, so I'm going to take the time uh, to explain it so that it is clear. We're going to assume that there's a function, the one on the node SN, that maps the sample space into a sample space S. Okay? And so, given this function, we're going to assume that there are two properties that hold. The first one says that the function converts in distribution to a limit S. OK, under the sequence of distributions of the data Pn. And then the second part will ask about this limit S and will basically require that the invariance property holds for this limit S. Basically, there's a group of transformations now that maps S to S, such that the distribution of the original S is invariant when you apply G to that particular random variable. Okay? So this is, I said in the introduction, that we're going to require that a function of the data converts, you know, has a symmetry approximately. And what we mean by that then is that there's a function that converts this to a limit, and that limit satisfies the invariance property that typically are required in randomization tests. So to show you um, the result, let me finish explaining now how the test behaves. We're going to reject the null hypothesis whenever large values of a test statistic, uh, whenever there are large values of a test statistic. And here, the test statistic is a function of Sn. See, this is not a function of S. It's just a function of this uh, function Sn. And as before, I'm going to let m denote the number of elements in the group of transformations and k1 minus alpha times m. 
And so as before, we're going to compute this test statistic for all possible transformations of Sn. We're going to have a list of test statistics that we're going to sort, and then we're going to take the kth uh, element. Yes? Can you say something, though, about how much of a weakening that is of the symmetry condition? The, go back one slide. The, I mean, is there an example that's obvious of uh, I'll show you later, but definitely, yeah, you can have distributions that are very asymmetric. These functions, at the end of the day, will be, say, think about a least square estimator, recenter, scale. There will be a lot of averaging going on. And so think about all the distributions that are not symmetric at all that will give you a central limit theorem f with a limited, you know, normal random variable. The normal is symmetric, and so it will hold. So the averaging part is what gives us the approximate symmetry that might not hold in the data at all. Yeah. So, now, the definition of this approximate uh, randomization test is basically, you know, you reject whenever the test statistic is greater than TK, reject with probability A if the test statistic equals TK, doesn't, don't reject if it's below TK. So if you think about it, this looks exactly as before, but where I replace the data with this function SN, okay? And what matters as well is that the test does not use the data beyond Sn. What this means is you take the data, you compute these functions, and once you have that, everything that follows is just a function of those functions. You don't have to go back to the data to compute some other quantities. Okay? And notice that you know, we're not assuming anything about the distribution of the data in terms of symmetry, invariance, and things like this. We're just assuming uh, something about this limiting object. Okay, so what's the result that we have in this paper? The theorem goes as follows. Suppose that the test statistic is a continuous uh, function. Suppose that G, these elements of group of transformations, are continuous as well. And then we're going to assume a conditions about how ties could happen uh, in the data, which is this condition C. It basically says if you grab two elements from this group of transformations, G and G prime, either the test statistic is uh, exactly the same in a deterministic way, or the test statistics are different with probability one. This condition, as you look at my look, you know, kind of strange at the beginning, uh, but we will argue that it's a very weak requirement, and we actually verify that it holds for, for test statistics like T, wall, absolute value of T, and things like this. Because, um, so I might have time to give you some intuition about it. But anyway, under A, B, C, and assumption RW, then you have that the null rejection probability of this test that we just described converges to alpha for any sequence in the null hypothesis. So, you know, we don't have uh, finite sample validity as before. We have asymptotic validity. But, you know, what you can see is that the test, you know, gives you converges exactly to alpha for any sequence in the null hypothesis, which is sort of like resembles the similarity that I uh, talked about before. So, there were a lot of challenges. You know, um, I won't have time to go over uh, the proof of this result. But basically, the challenges were the following. The main properties that you use to exploit that to show that the randomization test works in finite sample are violated in our context even for all n, you know, even for large n. So you have things that hold in the limit experiment, but along the sequence it fails all the time. So that means that the, the typical, uh, you know, proof that you use in, in randomization test context are not uh, very useful and we couldn't apply those. In addition, there are some papers, and one of my co-authors, Joe Romano, and, and you can go back to Hoftings, where they basically do asymptotics with randomization tests. But those asymptotic constructions are such that the number, the, the, the number of uh, elements in the group of transformation goes to infinity. That gives you a lot of advantages that we don't have, and so those type of proof are, are basically useless in this context. So we had to come up with different arguments, and the, the proof is, is basically exploits um, the almost sure representation theorem. So, the, well, I said this already. Basically, we have this ties requirement that, as I said at the beginning, it might sound a bit strange, but we verify that it holds for t test, absolute value t test, and wall type test statistic. We can check that it holds for pretty much uh, any uh, usual test statistic. We still have to verify for more. So, let me tell you now how this general construction works in the context that I explained in the introduction, where you have, you know, clusters and observations uh, that are dependent. So I'm going to use a picture that Matthias likes. So I'm going to uh, here represents the, uh, the data that we have that has distribution PN, and there's some null hypothesis. 
the first starting point in this type of application is the idea that you can take your data set, your entire data set, and somewhat classify the data into clusters. So I'm going to assume here that there are a queue of these clusters. And then if you look, you know, the clusters do not necessarily have to have the same size. Some can be bigger, some can be smaller. Okay, that's, that's fine for our approach. The important thing is that once you define the clusters, okay, you're going to use the observations within each of these clusters and you're going to compute a function. Okay? And each function that you're going to compute is going to be based only on observations from each cluster. The function is 1, it's going to use observations from cluster 1. Function 2 is going to use observations from cluster 2 and so on. And now once you have these Q functions S, okay, then the test that we're proposing is only a function of this functions S's, okay? There's nothing in here that will go back to the original data, okay? So these are sort of like the steps that we're going to propose. So in the applications that I'm going to present in a minute, the one thing that we'll have to ask ourselves to learn how to implement our test are basically three things. Like the first one is, what are the clusters? The second one is, what are these functions? And the third one is, do these functions satisfy the assumptions that we're making? And then if the answer to those questions is yes, you're fine, yeah. So if I have a regression on the, some, some of the, my regressors, for example, regress of interest is constant within cluster, can I, can I uh, apply this? Or? That's a good point because, you know, in a way we'll see, uh, yeah, the, the, the answer to that question is um, it will be useful if I had time to go over our empirical application. It depends on how you define the clusters. For example, in the empirical application, um, we're revisiting Angris and Lavi, and that's a paper that have like schools and the treatment is at the school level. Okay, so if you just take, define your cluster as a school, well, of course, you want to estimate the treatment effect and there's all, you know, ones. Okay, so, but if you look at how, you know, the randomization was done in that paper, pairs of schools were randomized ex ante that looked similar, and then one of them were to assign to treatment, the other one to control. For our method, we define a cluster as a pairs of schools. And now suddenly, um, you know, you can identify the parameter that you want. Now, since our method doesn't require the number of clusters to be big, okay, by aggregating, we're not, we're not losing, okay? So, so the, the answer, short answer to the question is that, you know, you should be careful about how you define your clusters, and since you don't have an incentive here to do the, you know, to have a, lar a large number of clusters, you can aggregate more so that the parameter that you care about is, you know, you can estimate it within a cluster. And do you have something to say about the choice of clusters in practice? N uh, no, we have nothing. Nothing to say about the choice of clusters. It's like, you know, not, not now at least, yeah. So in some cases you'll see it's not even, sometimes it's not a choice. I'll, sh I'll show you in the, um, in the, um, in, in, in a time series context, it's definitely like, call it like a tuning parameter, but in other cases, just given to you as, as uh, will be in the, in the different diff application. So yeah, it depends. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. So anyway, so again, to finish this relation to the cluster, suppose that the null hypothesis is that there's a parameter here, you know, that is equal to theta naught. It could be a coefficient in a regression, as, as Stefan said, and that's the null hypothesis. So here the clusters, we're assuming that there are Q clusters. I'm going to denote it X, J, N, and we're going to compute Q estimators of this parameter. So think again about regression. So you just run a regression within um, every cluster. So the a very standard setting is one in which you scale, you know, the estimators and recenter them, and then you have that Sn, which is a collection of these Q functions for each of these estimators, converges to a normal with a diagonal covariance matrix. Okay, this is, you know, uh, definitely s sufficient for what we need, but it's a case that is very standard, shows up a lot, and it satisfies the conditions that we need because now this limiting distribution is invariant to sign changes to each of these Q groups. Okay. So, as I said, our results apply more generally, okay, and in particular we could have different rates, rates that depend on unknown parameters or different limiting distributions, but for now, in order to, you know, since this is a short talk, let's just focus on sort of like this case as the benchmark case. All right, so let's think about a time series regression here, and I'm going to do, show you some simulations that are based on the setup proposed by Bester, Conley, and Hansen. This is very simple, we regress a random variable y, on a Z, okay? And so here we're gonna consider two DGPs. One is called the N DGP for normal, the other one is the H DGP for heterogeneous. And both will have this structure here where Z and epsilon follow in an autoregressive process, okay? In the design N, this disturbance is nu1 and nu2 or just independent normal random variables. In design H, 
they are a mixture of normals, but they are multiplied by a constant here that has a jump in the middle of the sample size. Okay, so basically you have these random variables having something up until the middle of the sample that you observe, and at some point they have a jump up or down. When, how do we implement our test in this context? We're going to do blocking. We're going to take the time series, we're going to blocks, we're going to take consider blocks of consecutive observations, and then we're going to run this regression for each block individually. That will give us, you know, all these estimators that are coming from least squares on every block. And then under, you know, some assumptions, you will have that the square root n times these uh, estimators will converge to a normal with a diagonal covariance matrix. In particular, whenever you start having heterogeneity and stuff, we're using results from Jennings and Prucha and some lemma in Bester, Cohen, and Hansen, and we can say that those uh, conditions hold for, for, the setup, um, for the setups that we're considering in this simulation. And so, how do we implement our method here? Well, we're going to compute the absolute value of the t-statistic, and the t-statistic applied to this function s, okay, which is the collection of these q-estimators, is just the average of these estimators minus the guess value divided by the sample standard deviation of these estimators. Okay? So, as I said before, if you look at the expressions that go on here, there's no need to go back to the original data once you have your q-point estimators. What are the alternative methods here that we can compare with? Well, the first one is what we call the standard approaches, okay? And so, uh, basically, that means get a full sample estimator uh, using least squares, call that theta hat f, and then divide by some sandwich, I'm going to call here. And the sandwich, you know, uh, will change depending on, you know, what uh, estimator of the variance covariance metric you're using here. If you're using some consistent hack estimator, then you will use something and you will use sort of like a new west critical value. And then you can also have options that will give you an inconsistent um, uh, estimator of the variance covariance matrix as in Kiefer and Balgesen. It will require a different tuning parameter. But I would call that, sorry, critical value, but I would call that the standard approach. There's another approach that we're going to compare with that is called the bias reduced linearization that intuitively tries to uh, pro use uh, unbiased estimator, cluster covariance estimator, and then do some uh, correction to the degrees of freedom of a t-distributed critical value uh, that use a complicated formula using eigenvalues of things. And this is a method proposed by Bell and McCraffy, and the reason why we have it in the discussion is because in our empirical application we're comparing uh, uh, we're using um, a, a, an application from Angus and Lavi, and in that paper they use this methodology. Now, the third approach is the approach by Bragamo and Mueller that will uh, propose use a t-test with a t-critical value, which is basically exactly what I showed you before that, you know, so all the comments that I said before about, you know, it could be quite conservative when you have heterogeneity and things like that, and it applies to a scalar hole here, so um, I'm not going to say much. And finally, the last method that we're going to propose, compare with is the method by Bester, Conley, and Hansen. In that paper, these authors, you know, propose an asymptotic framework that holds for a fixed number of clusters. Okay, they still use a numerator that is a full sample estimator, but in the denominator, they use a cluster covariance estimator. And they compare, instead of comparing to like a normal critical value, they will compare to a T distribution with Q minus grand uh, one uh, degrees of freedom. Now, this approach here is valid for fixed Q asymptotics, as it is the case for our method. So, you know, a few words are um, uh, worth saying is, um, the first one, Bester, Conley, and Hansen basically requires all the conditions in Ibrahim and Mueller. Okay, so all the advantages that I, comment, that I said before about the test being similar, and the test having good power for heterogeneous alternatives and things like this, uh, keep over here. So we keep all advantages over Ivanova Mueller, translate to advantages over Bester, Conley, and Hansen. Then Bester, Conley, and Hansen allows for heterogeneity in the C times epsilon random variable. Okay, they want the part that gives you a central limit theorem, but they require homogeneity in the distribution of the covariates, meaning the Z prime Z matrix needs to converge to the same matrix across clusters. So you cannot have heterogeneity in there. Our test doesn't need that, so you know, it allows for additional heterogeneity. And then finally, Bester, Cohn, and Hansen is only valid for a t test. They don't have an f test analog, so it doesn't allow you to do inference on vector parameters, so you're restricted to those scalars. As I said before, our, our test uh, you know, is, is easily adaptable to the other case. All right, so 
You do simulations, and what you get is basically a table like this. In the paper, there are more simulations, but I think the main story, you can get it from this table. Basically, if you move from settings where there's basically no dependence or very low dependence, and there's no heterogeneity at all, so in this case, is no dependence, homogeneity, IID thing, so uh, then everything works. And you know, so you see the randomization test, best recall enhancing, the bias reduce linearization, and they all give you numbers that are close to 5%. And once you start moving diagonally to a case where you have high dependence and heterogeneity, then the rest of the methods start to suffer and the randomization test you know, still survives. And if you look across the table, the worst case that we have in all the simulations for the randomization test is 5.9. So you see that here I'm not comparing with what I call the traditional approaches. The reason is that in the paper by Bester, Cornell, and Hansen, they did extensive simulations comparing to Hacks and, and Kiefer and Bogelson, and they basically concluded that Bester, Cornell, and Hansen uh, was controlling the rejection probability much better. So, you know, we're just by transitivity, we're, we're comparing to that. Um, so that's what we learned here from, from this time series case. If you look at power, then here we show size adjusted power. Then in the model AN, okay, um, we have the randomization test, which is the red line, uh, has very good power given that, you know, it's controlling size uh, very well. And if you move to model heterogeneous, well, here this is unfair because uh, the best recall enhancement test is not even shown to be valid, but what you get is something that looks like this, okay? So um, those are basically the properties of the test that we're proposing here. Let me go briefly over difference and differences. So here, think about a case where the data, you have a difference in different model, you have units and you have time, and there are some units that were exposed to a treatment at some point in time. So here I'm gonna let J1 be the treatment, treatment units, J0 be the control units, T1 the post-treatment time periods, and T0 the pre-treatment time periods, and consider a very uh, simple diff and diff model. So, we're here, here gonna follow a paper by Conley and Tabor, and we're gonna consider a situation in which you have a small number of policy changes. So, you know, you can consider a case in which you're looking at states in the US, and there are very few states that actually had a policy change during the sample that you're looking at. So we're gonna assume that the number of units in J1 is fixed, but we're gonna let the number of control units to be big, okay? And we're gonna here also assume that the number of time periods is big, and I'm gonna comment on that later. So how are you gonna apply our method? Well, the way to construct the cluster here is a bit unusual, so I'm gonna explain this. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take one of the treatment states and you're gonna pair that with all control states, and that will be your first cluster. Then you're gonna take the second treatment state and you're gonna pair that with all control states, and that will be your second cluster, and you keep doing this. Basically, how many clusters are you gonna get? As many clusters as control states you have. So, I'm sorry, treatment states you have. So, in this case, it's not a choice. You know, you just have as many clusters as um, treatment states. And then you're gonna estimate theta hat by least squares uh, using data from each of these clusters. So, if you do a simple math, basically uses a different diff estimator, it looks like this. And then basically you can show again under simple assumptions that square root t, these estimators recenter, basically converts to a uh, normal distribution with a diagonal covariance matrix, okay? So it is straightforward to modify this when you have individual level data. Uh, so we're not gonna talk about that. Notice here that the estimators are not independent at all because most of the observations are in common. Note also that you know, the clusters as defined as a group of observations that we're using to estimate the theta's are very dependent because most of the observations are in common, okay? But even though the approach still works quite well. So, and we can relax the large T assumption, but if we do that, we need to impose the stronger assumptions on the epsilon in the regression. But the good thing is that the approach works exactly in the same way. So there's no change that you need to do whether you're assuming that the data, you know, is going, the number of time periods are going to infinity, or if you're assuming more on epsilon, the implementation doesn't change for, uh, uh, given that. And you can, of course, remove the assumption that the number of control uh, goes to infinity, but if you do that, then the actual implementation of the test changes, and you need to account for that by uh, forming these joint pairs of units. So I'm not gonna talk about that. So uh, let me show you in here the numbers in the few minutes that I have. So the simulations, we simulated the uh, 
uh, diff and diff model as here. There are a number of things and parameters that I'm not going to go over with. What I can tell you is we consider base design that basically follows Conley and Tabor, and then we consider a bunch of deviations from that. And in particular, there are ones that introduce conditional heteroscasticity, heterogeneity in the treatment units, and asymmetry and heterogeneity in the seeds. Okay, because here is these are the cases in which we think you know our test can join because it doesn't require, it doesn't need to assume this type of things, and so we included this type of cases over here. So when you do the simulations, you basically get something like this. Here's the randomization test. This is a, the non-randomized version of our randomization test, which is a test that rejects whenever the test statistic is greater than TK and never randomizes. And uh, this is a test by Bragman and Mueller. This is a test by Conley and Tabor. This is the, what Duflo and company suggest is a cluster covariance estimator. This is the wild bootstrap, and this is the bias reduced linearization. So what you see from the table basically is that the randomization test works across the board. Some of the methods, like Ibrahim and Mueller, work pretty well as long as you don't have heterogeneity. When you start having heterogeneity, it starts to under-reject, as we see in the uh, previous table. Uh, the approach by Conley and Tabor works very well as long as you satisfy the assumptions that they need to implement their test. Here, we're basically uh, breaking one of their assumptions because their test is basically based on the idea that you can uh, use uh, residuals from the control states to approximate the distribution of the treatment state and in these settings the distribution of the treatment and the control states are different okay so when you do that then you get over rejection um, the wild bootstrap works remarkably well for not you know not having an actual proof that it works for uh, a small uh, number of clusters uh, but we're still thinking about that and the bias reducing linearization could you know works reasonably well for, for being heuristic, but you can have numbers that go from 2.93 to 10 in other simulations that I'm not showing over here, so um, it goes um, always. So uh, if you look at power, well, the power of our test, okay, this is not size adjusted, by the way, so just power as, as it is, rejection probability under the alternative. And so um, what we claim is that the test, you know, um, exhibit decent power, sometimes, you know, relative to other method tests um, that work in that context might suffer. Uh, for example, if you look at the base case, you know, our test is lower power than uh, Conley and Tabor, but across the board we think that even in the cases that, you know, we have very low power, those cases are very hard to handle where they have a lot of heterogeneity, asymmetry, and most of the test starts uh, over rejecting. And so, to conclude, we develop a theory of randomization test that applies when the symmetry holds approximately in the limit. We think that the method is widely applicable. We show some examples in the paper how to apply it to time series, diff and diff, cluster regression, and then also in particular this empirical application from Angus and Lavi. And then we believe that the method has several advantages over other methods that actually work when for a fixed number of clusters Q. And the advantage is, as I said before, you, you know, it's a method that's very easy to implement. You actually can do it in, in this data. You know, once you get your Q point estimators, it's, it's just a bunch of transformations over those. So that's it. Thank you. First, yeah, let me thank the organizers for organizing this. Um, I, I, to me, the people have probably been saying this since biblical times, but the, the distance between empirical work and econometrics seems to be growing and growing, and the idea of pulling empirical people and econometricians together, um, I think is a great idea. I hope this, this is the first of many conferences like this. Um, it's actually been nice that the gap isn't quite as wide as maybe I thought it was before I got here. Um, l let me also apologize. I might be a little bit off my game. I, I was a graduate student here, and I was also, not only was I a graduate student, I was an undergraduate student here. And in fact, my dorm was right across the street from here. So every time I come back onto campus, I feel like I'm 18 years old leaving home for the first time. And then I come up to this thing, and, and Lars does his introductory thing where he describes the discussants as old fogies, I think. <laughs> um, so I'm going through a bit of identity crisis right now, um, but, uh, but I'll do the best that I can.
Um, I'm going to start by, I'll, I'll, let me start by giving kind of a simple, uh, the, paper, the paper is very general and considers a broad, sort of a broad case. Let me c consider what I think is sort of the main case that we think about in the paper. I'll present that and then I'll, then I'll give my thoughts. So basically the idea is the following. So let's, let's take our data and we divide our data into Q different clusters and, and what you can do that is any way you want as long as the Qs are independent from the other groups. Okay, so we're going to have independence across Q. And the, the idea is that Q is not going to grow with sample size, unlike the sort of standard clustering that we do. So divide the data into Q different clusters. And then for each cluster, we're going to estimate some parameter, theta j, where j is, j is indexing the cluster. So under the null hypothesis that theta is equal to theta naught, um, you, I, you, I guess you, you guys, I think, know that. Um, that, that's what you're going to get. So, th so the key insight here, so the key basis for the test is noticing that as long as for any gj that's either minus 1 or, or, or 1, I can multiply all of these things by minus 1 or 1 and I'm going to get exactly the same distribution. Okay, that's going to be the key thing that we're going to use as the basis um, for the test. And obviously there's lots of different, you know, there's two to, the, two to the q different ways of doing this. So there's lots and lots of different ways to, to, to do this. So under the null hypothesis, pick some test statistic, which, gonna, which is going to be a function of these theta hats. And you can use an F test, is what we're, something like an F test is what they're going to use. T of 1, where 1 is a vector of all 1s, or the, or the basic data, is going to have the same distribution of T of G, where G is any other combinations of minus 1 and 1. So you're going to get exactly the same distribution. Then what, then what you're going to do is you're going to compare T, this T of 1, your base case, to all of the other permutations, all of these other possibilities, and see whether you're in, they have exactly the same distribution. So under the null hypothesis, T of 1 should just fit anywhere in this thing. So if we see that it's in the upper tail, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If we're if we're below the tail, we're going to accept the null hypothesis. So, so that's the basic, you know, it's more general than this, but that's the basic idea. Um, that's the basic idea that, that, that we're, we're doing here. Um, Okay, so, so my thoughts about this. I'm, I'm, I've, never been a fond, I've never been fond of long-winded discussions, so I'm going to make like one point and then sit down. Um, I'm not going to say much about the formal results. I assume that the proofs are right. I didn't check them very carefully, but this interactions com conference and I'm the empirical guy talking about the econometrics paper, so I don't think that's my goal. Um, I really I like the paper a lot. It's really nice. I like this idea. It's sort of this combination of asymptotic theory and finite sample theory, which is which is really nice and I think really really productive. And I can see cases where it's going to be consistent. Obviously, they they had a bunch of examples where they they you know they make, they kicked me in in Conley's ass, so they had a much better test than we did. So obviously, it must be a great paper because our paper is a great paper. Um, <laughs> So, so the, the one part where I'm left with, the, 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 the part that's a little bit odd is I still don't know exactly when to use it. I still struggle a little bit about when it's going to be a good thing and when it's, gonna, and when it's not going to be a good thing. And it's the symmetry thing that I, that I, struggle, that I struggle with. Sometimes, sometimes you know, people say, well, symmetry, normals are symmetry, so assuming things are symmetry is better than assuming things are, are normal, so let's assume symmetry. But sometimes that means, you know, as a guy who thinks about income inequality, if you want to study really, really poor guys, the way we can learn a lot about Really, really poor guys is studying really, really rich guys. Um, so whether we want, how seriously we want to take symmetry and exactly how much we want to use it um, is something that it's, it's, this is, I, I mean, you know, it's one of those things. I don't think the authors know and they don't need to know. I mean, we can see where the, where the paper goes from here. Um, but, you know, so here, here are my base, it's, it's sort of like small samples and kind of works um, with, with small samples if we have symmetry, but, but, you know, if the samples aren't large, so we're using the small sample stuff, um, why would we accept the, the symmetry assumption to hold? And sometimes you might, sometimes you might, that might not, and there's not much discussion in the paper about this. Um, if samples are large, why not use why not use asymptotic theory? And if you you know if you look in the slide before, essentially what they're using is the pro a property of a normal is that it's symmetric, and the test is based on on the fact that normals are symmetric. But normals are a lot of other things. I mean, normals have lots of properties. Why is symmetry the property of normality that we want to focus on um, for a good test? And I I don't I'm not sure what what the answer is. To me, and and here I'm, I'm actually I'm going to disagree with 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 something that. I've 
Levon said, and I'll, I'll be explicit about it before. Um, but, but actually, the nicest idea of this, where, where this works best, is really when we're combining small samples um, and, and large samples together. It, there's another point that, that could be clearer in the paper, and I know that they know this, because Yvon and I talked about the paper once in my office a couple years ago, and he made exactly this point to me. There's really two different reasons why symmetry might make sense here. One reason why symmetry might make sense is normality, and that's, that's the result that's focused on the other paper. But there's another reason why you might get symmetry. Another reason why you might get symmetry, symmetry is if you just have random assignments. So suppose we just standard old, um, we have a bunch of people, randomly we assign one guy the treatment, randomly assign another guy not that doesn't get the treatment. Under the null hypothesis that the, the, there's no treatment effects, the difference between the treated guy and the untreated guy should be symmetric under the null hypothesis. So that's another reason why, why we want symmetry. And that's kind of showing up. In a, it's, it's kind of at the heart of a bunch of the empirical examples, even though it's not made explicit. So let me make it a little bit more explicit. So here's essentially, the, the, that's, that's what the cluster, the case that they look at, the Angris and, and Levy case, they didn't talk about. Um, looks very much at this case where randomization is done at the school level, but you have individuals at the students. So you have, and the, and the way we want to think, the way at least I want to think about the asymptotics is that we've got lots of students within a school, but we only have a, we only have a finite number of schools, but the randomization is done at the school level. So there's some sense in which, um, in, in which the, the amount of randomization we have, that doesn't get large um, in, in terms of making, uh, in terms of inference. Um, so sticking to somewhat, I, I'm saying I stick to their notation, that's insulting their notation. Um, no, it's always hard to write good notation for this. But, it, but let me take the model, um, and, and so yi is equal to that object, and of course I can take the error term, and I can write this error term as a school specific group, or the cluster specific mean, um, plus, it's actually not, it's this, this in the Angus and Levy case would be the school specific mean plus, plus the residual. Um, and, then, and then as sample sizes get large, well, not as sample sizes get large, alpha hat is going to be equal to that object there. Alpha naught plus this object here plus this object here, which has to do with the individuals in the school. Oh, there should be tildes in front of the epsilons. But, so, so, this, so essentially what's nice of, to me about this example and, and what's not emphasized in the paper even though it's really what's going on is you really got both things going on at once. So the idea is that the, the central limit theorem is going to say that these two things are going to be approximately symmetric. That's what the result in the paper says. But then the fact that you've got random assignment and literally this is the way that Angrist and, and Levy do it. They take a randomized school and a non-randomized school and stick them together and then, and then run a regression with those where you're literally going to get this difference. And here's the thing that um, here's the thing that, I, that Yvonne said that I'm going to somewhat disagree with. Yvonne said that you need, I don't think you meant to say this, but he said you need consistency within the clusters. Here you don't get consistency within the clusters. You're going to converge to that object, but that object is going to be symmetric because of the experiment. And that's what's really, I mean, that's what's really nice about um, that's what's really nice about this particular example is you get symmetry and you got both things going on at once. And that's what's, I think, new, you know, really fundamentally new about this paper um, that, 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 that I hadn't seen before. Um, now, of course, this is going to be special to this particular case. So, for example, if rather than doing one-to-one -one matching, you were doing one-to-many matching. So, for you had one school that got the treatment and three schools that didn't get the treatment, you'd be comparing A to J to A to K bar. And there, it's not you know, it's less obvious that that you would believe the symmetry assumption. It's also the symmetry assumption in this case works really well if the null hypothesis is no is no effect of the treatment. Then then you get symmetry. But if, the, if, the, if you think that there's some effect of the treatment, then the symmetry thing is sort of a less obviously good assumption. You could assume you know, alpha naught is equal to 1, but then you're taking the fact that treatment effects are homogeneous very, very seriously. If treatment effects are heterogeneous, then, then the symmetry assumption um, it, it seems, seems more questionable. 
Um, so anyway, I, you know, I really cool paper. Monte Carlo, you know, the Monte Carlo suggested it's nice. And one really nice thing about about this is a lot of the other things that they're comparing to were designed with one purpose in mind, and, and they're doing that purpose. They have this general test that can that serve that serves, you know, is many it does many different things. So they're they're comparing themselves to tests that are designed for the examples that they're looking at, and still and still the test does does really well. So I I mean I I, I like the potential. Here, I think this is this is really nice. I think going forward, the question is we've got to get a better sense of, of, of really the symmetry assumption and when that seems like a good assumption and when it's not a good assumption. That's it. <laughs>